Hello and welcome back to the Inquisitor podcast. Today, I'm genuinely delighted to have as my guest, Bob Mester. Uh, Bob is the author of Demand Side Sales 101, which is about how you can stop selling and help your customers to buy. Bob, welcome. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here today. Excellent. Bob, could you give us 60 seconds or so on your background and how you got to write this book? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, in a million years, I'd never think that I'd ever write a book about sales, but uh, I'm, a, I'm an engineer. I basically have been breaking things for 50 years. I've been uh, <laughs> fixing things for about 45, and I've, I've been building things for over 30 years. I've, I've helped uh, develop and launch over 3,500 different products and services wow. over a range of industries from uh, uh, high-tech and uh, software to uh, food products and uh, medical devices, and you name it, I've pretty much worked on it. Excellent. Thank you. And what was it that inspired you to write Demand Side Sales? So, so I've done seven startups. And one of the things that I've, I realized that the hardest thing of, any, of, of building any business is sales. And the first kind of clue that I got was like at, at the time, like I, I went back to school, I went to school and basically got an MBA. And, and what I realized is there's no sales professors. I'm like, why, why aren't there any sales professors? They have marketing, they have uh, finance, they have HR, they have operations, they have strategy, but like sales is like the hardest part of all of this. And there's no, nobody there teaching it. And if they are, it's like, I've got lawyers teaching negotiations for sales, or I've got HR talking about compensation for sales, but like the hardest part is selling. And so part of this was, was like, somehow we need to get sales into uh, kind of uh, at least the academic realm. I think the second part is that when you go to incubators and you like having done so many new products and helping people with products, people don't realize they sell all the time. They sell like investors. They, 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 they have to sell new employees. They have to sell founders. They have to sell customers. Like there's selling happens all the time. And to be honest, I, I kind of came to the aha that, that selling is actually a, what I call a supply side concept, which is we build a product and we figure out how to sell it or push it to the market. But the reality is, is like on the other side of the world, it's like there's, there's people have to buy things and it's like, why do people buy things? And so this was this, this the aha of what I, I made in, in the innovation world. But then I realized like, why not apply this, the, these concepts to the sales world to help people understand like the sales process is almost like it's been assumed what it is and we have a funnel but the reality is, is our funnel or our sales process should actually mimic the way people buy. And we think about the buying part as very transactional. But the reality is, is buying is very emotional. It's emotional and it's long. And we think about the moment that people ask for a demo and then sign a contract and we install is like, that's, that's, that's the, the, the degree of engagement. And it's like, no, no, no. It's much longer than that when you look at it from the buying side. So it was really about kind of bringing, if you will, a, either a fresh perspective or, a, or the other side of the world, the other side of uh, demand side to kind of uh, the sales process to help people become better at helping people make progress. It's interesting. My pal, Mark Schaefer, says that you should think as the customer, not about the customer. What customers want is better outcomes. Uh, in, in your book, you make uh, the point, you know, people don't buy a quarter-inch drill, they buy a quarter-inch hole. And the, the problem is that very often with most sales methodologies, traditionally we've been taught, talk about features and benefits, which I don't think has ever really worked. And then there's the emphasis on pain, uh, which is fine, but most of the customers already ex uh, understand what the symptoms are, even if they don't necessarily understand the cause. Mm -hmm. And the journey happens way, way, way before your marketing ever touches them. Colin Shaw talks about the customer journey of going to McDonald's. And the customer journey begins when your kid screams that they're hungry. And you go through <laughs> the battle of driving through traffic with them uh, committing World War III in the back. And then the fight to get their order. And then they change their mind. And then you yep. uh, give the order through the squad box. And then you have to give it twice. And then they change their mind again. You have to give it again. Then you get to the payment window. Then you get to pick up. And do you check it there and then? Or do you risk it because you've got six hungry cars, the car loads of people behind you? Then you've got milkshake all over the car. And then you've got indigestion and vomit. And then you've got to get rid of the packaging. <laughs> and that's the customer journey. 
So let's explore that side of things first. Well, of all. Let me let me just elaborate. On, let me elaborate a little bit on that okay. one because I think the fact is, is it's it's not just McDonald's, but it's like like think about at what point does somebody start to realize like God, we need a new CRM system. Like it's not typically it's going to be years of people kind of uh, working around and frustrated and then something has to happen. And so it's what are the dominoes that have to fall to actually get people to, to, to say like, mm, I think we're going to buy a new CA. We're going to buy Salesforce. Like it, it, it's not a 90 day buy. It's like the thing is, is so part of it is to actually take this, this step back. It's the same thing with a mattress, right? At what point do you kind of say like, today's the day I'm going to buy a new mattress? Well, the reality is, is the, the competitors to a new mattress are things like scotch and working out late. Are, are you working out late in the evening so you get tired or staying up late or, or z <laughs> and, and so there's these other things that we don't realize are, are competitors or workarounds that are part of, the, part of their process to actually get to basically a new product. And so this is the thing where we've been so myopic in focusing in on that transactional side that we think it's like the demo and then they buy. <laughs> Well, it, it couldn't be further from the truth because what you're describing there is a shared collective experience. And the analogy yes. I like to use on that is the idea that you have a bomb night bombing raid. And every time a bomb drops, uh, there's a little flash of light and a little sound of an explosion. And those are the collective frustrations throughout the organization. And yes. they're lobbing these problems over the wall to procurement. They're collectively experiencing all these different frustrations, but they don't necessarily join the dots. And eventually uh, they uh, think, ah, right, this is maybe what we need. And then they go out to market. But this has been going on probably for months or years, decades even. You as a seller have to be way, way more strategic than the average salesperson because most of them are tactical, selfish, and focused on making the transaction in order to hit their quota for this month or this quarter. The buyer doesn't give a damn about any of that. Well, so let's start with the mindset of leadership within the vendor organization about how they have to shift their thinking so that vendors are no longer selling that badly. I actually think this goes all the way back to how do we actually describe job description for employees <laughs> because when you think about it when we're looking for a new employee it's like well how many years experience do you have do you know these do you have these skills but we don't tell them anything about the job we tell them nothing about what they're supposed to like the progress they're supposed to be making and so to me it gets back to not only being able to understand the situation or the pain of the what's going on what i call the the push of the situation but the, the, the desired outcomes and the trade-offs you're willing to make in order to make that progress, right? The, the, the whole aspect is, is everybody, wants, everybody wants every feature and every benefit until they run out of time and money, <laughs> yeah. right? And, and so it's that whole thing of like, oh, we can do this, we can do this, oh yeah, we, we'd like, we, we, we want it all. And it's like, oh, it's that much? Oh, it's going to take that long? It's like, oh, okay, so what are we going to give up? And so part of this is to realize like, Part of the sales process is trade-offs and being able to understand. And so, so again, coming from the innovation space or coming from the product development space is like, how do we prototype scenarios for them so they understand the trade-offs? They, like, we can do this quicker, but it's going to be more expensive this way. Or we can actually do this customized, but it's going to take longer and be this much. And, and so what happens is we usually give people one thing to choose from. Or we force them to choose one from us and one, one from somebody or two, two from other people. But they actually need contrast to make choices. Like most people choose by actually eliminating. I call it elimination theory. So what happens is if I give three options, the first thing they do, they go, they'll tell you which one they don't want. And it goes to the side. And then what happens is people look at the other two that are left and they don't compare them to each other. They actually compare them to the one they threw out. And so they actually choose by eliminating the two they don't want. Very interesting. Right? And so you start to realize, like, all of a sudden, it's like, well, I need to give them the best deal. The only language they have is, like, I just need a better deal because they can't even articulate what they want or the trade-offs they have to make. And so, like, like I've seen some numbers where people go, like, well, you know, the, the, there's, like, 47% of people, you know, go all the way through the process and don't make a decision. That's a sales problem. 
that's the thing because we don't actually enable them to make the trade-offs because we're too afraid to get no that we actually don't want them to say no, but they have to say no to something. Well, Corporate Visions did some research and they put it as high as 60% end up wow. with the status quo precisely because of lack of contrast. They're unable to see the white space between what one vendor is offering, the yeah. status quo and all of the competition. And the single biggest reason they go for the status quo is they just can't see the difference. Well, so the, I, so in the framework, I talk about this uh, quite a bit. And I say that, that it's not just the status quo, but it's the anxiety of the new solution. Like any one of these solutions, what do we do with our old data? What do we do with, you know, how do we actually train everybody up? There's like all this anxiety about moving to the new. And so part of it is, is they're not prepared to make the trade-offs. And what I call the push of the situation isn't great enough that for them to overcome the anxiety of doing something different. And so it's not the features and benefits that get people to go. It's the reduction of anxieties that get people to, to actually make these decisions. And so we keep thinking we need to add more features to get people to buy. And I just think that's a false, very bad notion that we, when we add more features, we actually add things that people don't want. And then they want a discount because it's like, why would I pay for this whole thing? If it's, if this whole thing's a hundred thousand, I only need 20% of it. How about you give me a discount? And it's like, because we're not listening to their world. And you, you've touched on the fundamental question here is, are you listening to your customers? And I, one of the things that frustrates the living hell out of me is how few organizations actually genuinely listen to their customers. Marketing doesn't sp even speak to customers. The R&D people very often engineer in isolation. And my pal, Jerry Lemberg, who was one of the four original founders of Fairchild Semiconductor and one of the first investors in Intel and Oracle and Microsoft, used to describe entrepreneurs as people who produce elegant solutions to problems that don't exist. <laughs> you only have to look at how over-engineered. You look at Word, for example. I mean, how many people use anything other than the font size and uh, maybe using bold, italic, and underline? I mean, that's pretty much it. You know, I've been using uh, word processors for the nigh on 40 years. And that's pretty much all I ever used. Why do I need all that other functionality? Some people do. I get it. You know, why would I pay for it? I, I think that's right. And the thing is, is that what they would say is, well, you don't know you need it till yet until we have it. And my whole thing is, is like, what's the progress you're trying to make? And what you find is people who are really good writers, they actually have a very, very stripped down word processor. It's like, part of the job is to get the stuff out of my head and I don't need to worry about bullets or indents or like any of the formatting because it's, it's, it actually slows me down in my thinking. And so what you start to realize is like, not only does word over-engineered, but it hinders me from actually being able to accomplish what I want to do. And so this is where we're not paying attention. So it's not only just listening to your customer. This is where, so I've been, uh, you know, I've been trained in both criminal and intelligence interrogation because at some point I realized that customers lie to me and they don't actually know what they want. And it's not their fault. I'm not trying to say they lie on purpose. It's, they it's, lie to protect it's, themselves. Right. Well, part of it is protecting, but part of it is like, like, I really don't know what I want right now. I know that I have this problem, but I, I'm not smart enough to even know how to describe what I want, what's possible, Right. The reality is like, it's not only what they say, it's how they say it. So like when you ask, so, so one of the things I, I, like I teach a lot right now, and one of the things I'm teaching is like, if somebody says, God, you know, your product, it's, it's really, it's, it's good versus your product's good, right? Same words on the transcript, but very different meanings. The next question on the first one is, so what's not right with it? Because you know, they went down at the end and they paused and they stuttered a little bit on, on being good because it's like, well, it's almost like it's good enough versus when it was really, when they say it's really good, it's like, oh, what'd you like about it? And so what happens when we pre-program the questions, we pre-program what we're supposed to say, we're not actually listening because all we're worried about is the next question. I try to teach this notion of like, I don't think of the next question until I've heard the answer to the previous question. And people are like, how do you do that? I'm like, I listen. <laughs> Again, I couldn't agree more, Bob. If you are a seller and you are thinking about your next question while the prospect or the customer is still talking, you do them and you a disservice because very often you miss the golden nugget, which comes at the end. And also 
you need to learn how to revel in the silence. If you uh, yeah. give yourself four to 11 seconds after a prospect has finished speaking, very often they will continue to speak and they will give you more insight. Also, if you use the silence to then think about your next question based on the response that you have had previously, based on not only what they say, but how they say it and the intent and meaning and the motive behind what their response was, then you start to ask insightful questions that very few salespeople do. Most salespeople ask questions to gather information if they're bad. If they're slightly less bad, they ask questions to gain understanding, but very few deliver questions that offer insight to the prospect or the customer. And so you never really get to understand what the, their struggle is. So talk to me about that. How do you get to understand and solve the customer's struggle? Well, so the first thing, so to, to be honest, it's like, it's one of those things where you, 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 you ask the VP of sales or the VP of marketing of any company and say like, tell me about the customer and they know everything. Like they know like age, they know income, they, they have like all this segmentation. About, and, then I, and then I asked the question, like what causes somebody to say, today's the day you're going to buy new windows for your house. And they just look at you like deer in headlights. What do you mean? Like, well, you, you know that there are 14 million people who say they need new windows, but only a million buy. What, what causes the 1 million to say today's the day? Well, we know who they are. I'm like, yeah, but I need to know why. And so part of this is that I start with actually like a post-mortem of sales. We go talk to people who recently bought. We talk to them to say what things had to happen in their lives. So we actually don't talk about the product at all. Absolutely. So if they say, well, you know, boy, the, you know, the windows is like, oh, they were, you know, they were triple paned. I'm like, why does that matter? I know why triple pain is there, but I actually have to play a little bit dumb to get their words of why they think it's there. It's like, well, it's going to keep me warmer and save me energy. Well, why is that important? One of the things is that when I was very young, I was able to travel to Japan and work in Japan and learn a lot of different Japanese development methods. And one of the things they had is the five whys. And it's like they had this notion of how do you get to product agnostic requirements? I don't even know what that means. And they're like, how do you actually, how, how do you figure out what the customer wants without talking about a solution at all? And that's where a lot of this came from was this notion of like having to actually take a step back to understand not about my product, but how do we fit into their lives? So the reference point is their lives. And then how does something fit into their life versus this product? And how does this product fit into them? And so to me, it's the difference of I'm trying to go from the consumer out to the product as opposed to the product out to the consumer. And so it's flipping that lens in a very different way. And so part of this is understanding like we don't change unless they're struggling moments. So to get to your, your initial question is how do you find this is struggling moments are the seed for all innovation. And it, it's on both sides of the world, both sides, the, meaning the, the supply side of, of companies, when they struggle with something, they need to innovate, but customers innovate as well we have to actually find these struggling moments. We are actually more creatures of habit than anything. And we'd rather do the same thing over and over again than actually try to change. So when we change, there's energy, there's emotional energy, there's social energy, there's functional energy. There's things that say, today's the day I need a new mattress. And that's what you have to go find out is what are the dominoes that have to fall in people's lives? What are those struggling moments that have to lead up to them saying like, yeah, today's the day we need a new mattress. So we start by talking to people who bought, not people who want to buy. People who want to buy are actually called fakers, right? They want all this stuff, but they haven't had to make all the trade-offs. So the reason why we talked to people recently bought is it's not only what they say, let's say early in the process, but ultimately what are the things they gave up in order to make sure that they could get, make this happen? I think it's also important to speak to people who've stopped buying so yes. You find out what you've done wrong and well, change their behavior. Uh, yeah, yeah, buying, yeah. They're buying on a regular basis and suddenly there's a shift in behavior pattern. Yes. So it's all about that. So it's really in, in the engineering terms, it's a boundary problem, right? So here's the here's here's like the things that blow a lot of salespeople's mind. When somebody doesn't buy you or somebody fires you, they're still making progress. 
they have found something else. And so what you need to understand is at what point in time, what are you not doing or what are, is not, what, what's changed in their lives that basically say, you know, they need to actually stop using your software and use somebody else's software. So churn is a combination of like, which, and what's kind of crazy is you start to realize sometimes it's the same reasons why they come and why they leave. And so you have to be able to understand the, the, the sets of things. So that's one, one other important point is that most people are trying to find the root cause. The one thing that caused somebody to say, today's the day I'm going to buy or today's the day I'm going to leave. And what I will tell you is it's not never one thing. It's, it's root causes. It's sets of things that, to your point, add up. It's brain highlighting all these different things that kind of add up and it, they accumulate to actually give the energy to basically make the change. So part of this is to understand and Again, I use the word space and time, but like when and where do these things happen that cause people to say, today's the day I'm going to hire you or today's the day I'm going to fire you. And when you understand that process, now you're actually ready to sell. It's about understanding clusters of motive, cause and intent. That's right. Uh, all aggregating at one moment in time that say today is the day. That's right. The other thing is the language they use. So for example, when you start to hear things that those clusters and people say, oh, I want to be healthy. In one cluster, healthy means like, I don't want to die, right? Another cluster healthy is like, I want to actually go skiing. And another cluster healthy means I want to look good in the clothes that I'm wearing. And so they all use the same word, but they all have different meanings. And so if you don't actually understand these sets, you end up saying, oh, everything's about healthy. And there's like 22 things I have to do to make it healthy, but I can't do all of those healthy things. And so which one are we really targeting? So we end up saying like, well, we're, we're looking for the healthy eater. It's like, well, what does that mean? And again, what we understand healthy means may be very different from what a customer oh, yeah. understands. When I set up my training business, I thought I sold sales training. And what I didn't realize was that People would come to me because they wanted IVF treatment because they desperately wanted a child. And mm -hmm. I, I know that there are at least two sets of twins out there that came as an indirect result of the training work that I did with them. There is a horse <laughs> called Jacob running around fields today because his owner didn't want to turn him into glue and dog food. And 14 years later, he's still jumping around fields, leaping over fences because there was an 80 grand vet's bill and this was somebody who had lost his business because of a customer not paying on time. And he ended up going into liquidation. But actually, his priority was the horse. Now, who would have right. thought that someone would be so emotionally attached? But that wasn't, you know, the, getting back onto his feet wasn't the issue. It was how does he save Jacob? So we really have to be savvy and we've got to be patient and understand that human beings are not rational creatures. No. We are creatures of emotion. And to paraphrase Mark Twain, when you understand the whole world is mad, everything makes sense. That's right. Everyone I is a messed up sick puppy. Yeah, yeah. I, here's the thing is, I always think about the fact is the irrational becomes rational with context. And so what happens is, is you actually don't know, right? Like when something seems like it doesn't make sense, it's like, okay, you don't have the rest of the story. It's not that they're crazy. It's the fact that you can't actually see through their eyes. And so you start to realize like, this is a long time ago, but I was doing some work and just trying to study basically what caused people to say, today's the day we're going to buy home gym equipment, right? And so we'd go in these houses and we'd talk to people and they'd show us their refrigerators and they'd show us all these other things and they'd tell us how they worked out. It's like, and you could see what was going on. And I just remember at one point where we're just getting ready to leave and I'm like, oh, you know what? I haven't seen the freezer. Can, do you mind if I just take a quick picture of the freezer and, and you see the gasp on, the, on their face going like, uh, okay. And you just like the head goes down and they look and it's like, and they open the freezer and there's five gallons of ice cream. <laughs> and all these different ice creams and I, and, I, and I finally go I'm like you show me all these other things you do and then there's this and they're like well this is really why I work out all the time because I love ice cream and I know that there's this trade-off between I can't eat it all the time and I have to work so I work out every day so at the end of the day I can have my bowl of ice cream I'm like Wait, what and you start to realize like nowhere did that come out and nowhere were they willing to actually art articulate that until we actually kind of discovered it and so part of this is 
when you're doing it, you're not trying to be judgmental. You're just trying to understand. And so this is the other thing is that, that this is where you have to have these techniques of like dummying up and being able to say like, look, I, I don't understand. I'm confused. And they'll be like, all right, let me tell you what's really going on. This is where your point of being emotional is as much as people would say is like, I'm doing an RFP. The first thing I would say is if you're actually in the RFP business, you're probably already too late, <laughs> right? The second part is when you actually see how people make decisions and you do a post-mortem on how people decide, they always say, well, we pick the lowest price person, right? And it turns out that they rarely actually pick the lowest price person, but they never tell anybody that until you actually do this post-mortem. And so part of this is to actually take the time to go back and understand why you won things, why you lost things, what were the real decisions and trade-offs they made, and what caused them to basically say today's the day, and what were they really hoping for? The interesting part is like people say like, I want to do one thing. Like, so this, I did some interviews this week where somebody said something to the effect of like, you know, I struggle with printing, so I need to add a printer. But when you actually understood what they, why they were printing, it was really about, I need to proofread. And I don't know how to proofread any other way besides printing it. And so the moment he actually learned a new way to proofread, he didn't have to print anymore. And so it's this notion of not focusing on just what they say, but taking that, that almost that wide angle lens and taking a step back to understand what part of the process is really what's really going on. And all of a sudden you start to realize there's way more opportunity for innovation and to, to actually help people because beside them saying like he needs a new printer. Well, I, I think this leads very neatly into a uh, part of the book that I thought was really very interesting, uh, which is how you map the difference between the demand buying side against the supply sales side and understand how those two things aren't necessarily compatible. And if you want to generate sales, you have to partner with the customer and understand that journey in order to deliver uh, success in the customer's eyes. Otherwise, what you end up with you might get a transaction, but you end up with a dissatisfied customer. Yeah. And then you're back to square one, because not only have you now got an upset customer who fires you, but now you've got to go out and prospect again. I think there's a false economy here. And again, I bring it back to leadership and to management and to investors, because so many of them spend their time focused on hitting this month's or this quarter's target, getting the deal over the line. The customer doesn't give a damn about your target. They don't care about what revenues you're trying to bring in. They don't care about your share price. What they do care about is, can you fix my problem? And right. is this going to be a solution that I'm not going to regret investing in? Because anticipated regret and blame are another big reason why people don't buy. Because they don't believe you. They don't trust you. And you need to make this easy for them. It's got to be a safe investment. And especially if it's a big problem, they want to make sure that this is going to solve it. Like one of the worst things you can do is say like, oh, it's the end of the quarter and we're going to give you a 20% discount if you actually do it before the end of the quarter. You're Okay, three days, three weeks later, they're going to buy. And, and the fact is, is they're actually thinking it's the value it can be. And the reality is you just gave a discount because of a guess you made 12 to 24 months ago about numbers that you had to hit. And the reality is, is I call it the church of finance. Like we all have to bow and, give homage to the fact that we got to hit our numbers. And the reality is, is like at some point we're destroying value because we have to hit our numbers. Right? And, and, and so it's creating a problem for yourself down the line. Oh, it, yeah, because it, now you have behavior of like, think of how the automotive business or the furniture business has destroyed themselves because every week we got a sale now. Who's going to buy anything at full price? Like, I will tell you this, when I'm buying high quality furniture, I know that I'm going to pay full price and I, that I'm okay with that. But otherwise you just wait, <laughs> right? What I've done is basically, so I've been doing this method of uh, called jobs be done for a long time and that people don't buy products, they hire them to make progress in their lives. And one of the things that we talk about is there's something called the forces of progress that push the pull, the anxiety and the habit. But the other thing is this timeline and that they have a timeline that they follow. And it doesn't matter whether you're actually, you know, buying a, you know, a, a quart of strawberries, a new cell phone, a house, a new piece of software, they all, all these six phases happen and they happen in a very systematic way and that to be honest customers have their own system to make progress so the first thing is is the first phase is basically what we call first thought it's like creating the space in the brain for a solution to fall into if there's no space 
they actually, whatever you say just bounces right off their head. And so part of it is, as, you, as, as part of marketing's role is to actually provide inputs to the customer so they can create the space that they can see solutions or see the problem, to be honest. So you do that by asking questions. How long haven't you been able to sleep? You know, or basically stating the obvious, why do you look so tired? Right. Those are the kinds of things or, or stating the obvious, like how many bottles of Zequel are you going to take before you realize like that's not working? <laughs> right. There's things where you have to do. But here's the other part is you don't actually offer your solution. You just get them to think about it. Think about it. As it's the space that you create in the gut that basically starts to fester. It starts to actually, you know, mull or it starts to ferment where it's, it's creating energy that causes them to do the next phase, phase two, which is basically what we call passive looking, which is really about learning. They don't know enough about it, whether it's a real problem, whether it's it, whether they should do anything about it. It's almost educating themselves to literally figure out how to go out and look or even talk to the other people in the company about it, right? And then you move to phase three, which is active looking. This is where they want to see possibilities. They at least have some language. They know what's going on, but they but it's almost like, a, I, I, I think of it as like magic. It's like, well, what, what about this? And could we do that? And they, they haven't really pieced anything together. This is where it's like, I, I want it all, but I, and, and I have no idea what it costs, right? Then there's phase four. Phase four is this deciding piece. It's the aspect of framing and making trade-offs about spending the money, what's the timing, does it meet all the security responsibility, like all that stuff that now they're actually connecting dots, and now it's about making the tough decisions. And so we, we confuse the fact of active looking, of seeing possibilities, and the heavy work of actually deciding and most people try to merge it all in one. I show them the demo, they ask me some questions, and then I close. It's like, no, 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 no. There's a lot more to do there. The thing is, is that at deciding, when they finally decide, that is actually where satisfaction is locked in. The expectations to actually deliver. So they might have said some stuff in passive or active looking, but by the time they get down to, to deciding, they've made trade-offs that then set the expectation for what, what progress they're trying to make, what delivery means, and what satisfaction means. And so then you start to actually worry about first, basically the phase five, which is first use. It's like, how do you actually install? How do they actually feel like they're making progress with what they've decided? How do, they, how do you know that this is helping them? And then phase six is really about how do you build it into a, a habit and build it in a way that makes it uh, sustainable? By the way, as they do first use and ongoing use, there are new struggling moments that come up that you have to address. And so this is where I keep thinking we, we have marketing then passes leads off to sales that part uh, then pass things off to customer success. But my belief is they actually all have to be part of the entire process of, of the customer's journey. I need marketing to help me on board. I need marketing to actually tell, help people realize what are those new struggling moments. I need sales actually up front to help ask questions. I need customer support to actually help people understand how they have to change their systems. Like there's all this stuff and we, we end up trying to do these handoffs in between and you're much better off building teams that work together with customers as opposed to handing things off between functions and being efficient, but not necessarily effective. This raises a really interesting question, and I don't know whether or not this is something that uh, you can help me with. I have a fundamental belief that most compensation systems in sales and marketing actually generate unintended negative consequence. Oh, for uh, sure. And what I'm curious about is if we apply your model, how do you believe compensation schemes should be structured? And not necessarily a final working prototype. But it strikes me that marketing, sales, customer success, operations all need to be compensated so that we drive the right behavior, that there is a reason for marketing to speak to the customer. There's a reason for customer success to feed back to sales and marketing. And we have to drive those behaviors so that we get uptake and we get a utilization of the product and we get satisfied customers who then go out and do our marketing for us. Yes. I think if we can come up with compensation schemes that drive that kind of behavior, then everybody wins. But right. it's complicated. Have you got any thoughts? So 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 one of the things so so I don't I don't have a complete solution to it, but I'm very aware of the problem. And so so I have um 
two books that are kind of uh, in the midst of developing as uh, follow-ups. So the, this is a Demand Side Sales 101. Demand Side Sales 201 is I'm partnering with basically marketing experts, sales experts, and, uh, and onboarding and customer success experts to say like, how do these tools that everybody talks about fold into this timeline? And so it's a more of like the how-to manual of like, what are some tools, techniques, methods that you should be doing? And 301 is about actually changing the way we run metrics and measure the process of sales. Because I think it's actually very fundamentally flawed. And, and it's not really sales's fault or marketing's fault, like the, like the funnel. We tend to measure things that are easy to measure and then make them meaningful, as opposed to understand the meaningful things at, that are usually hard to measure. So for example, one of the things that we're working on right now is this aspect of leads. And the way leads are distributed are either distributed by segments, right? Or basically they're a big company, they're a small company, they're in your region, somebody else is in somebody else's region. It got to be about proximity or some demographic attribute of the company. But what we're figuring out is one is, can we actually understand, do some very preliminary conversations to then understand kind of which job they're in and where they are in the timeline. And then what we're doing is we're actually giving if you will, chips to the salespeople and have them bid on the leads, right? And so it's having people really, because at some point it's like almost the luck of the draw of who gets which lead to basically who will close faster. And there are people who are really good at nurturing people through that timeline. They end up because of quote quotas, they end up being pushed to the point of like, well, you know, they're not a good salesperson because they can't close, but they're actually very sensitive to how people buy versus somebody else who literally gets things that are where they're in deciding already. And it's like, oh boy, they can close them fast, but it had nothing to do with them. It had everything to do with where the customer was. And so by building a betting table for the leads and having a better vetting process, I now actually, most people say they need more leads. I always say, I want less leads. I want actually more qualified, less leads. Because at some point, if I have 10,000 leads, and I got to follow up on all of them. The reality is, is like at some point, I'm actually wasting my time and theirs. And so part of this is being able to understand like, where are people in the timeline? Are they literally like, I don't, I don't, I know I have a problem. I don't know what to do. And so you start to realize you have to be able to qualify these people, not from will they buy our product, but what is their problem? What progress are they trying to make? Where they are in the timeline? And then how do you help them what things can you provide them to help them make the progress they need to make? This is really fascinating. And I'd love to talk to you again on another um, yep. podcast, if I may, specifically about this subject, because I think success in the future will be dependent on an individual and an organization's capability in collaboration. Collaboration internally collaboration with the comp your own competition particularly in yes. because a vendor of a firewall or a password solution is just one tiny moving part in right. the overall security stack which is one part of their overall IT stack which is part of their overall business strategy and unless you're able to collaborate with your competitors i think you're going to find it very difficult in the future you need to be able to collaborate with your partners. And above all, you have to be able to collaborate with the different moving parts within your customer. But more often than not, what we see is the hardest part is to get collaboration going within your own organization. That's, that's right. That's right. That's why I, I see actually more energy. If you think about the energy of the organization, there's more energy between the and friction inside the company than there is to go help customers. Give me better leads. What did you sell these people? To be honest, as we, as we head down this path, and I'm sure we're going to have more than one conversation <laughs> over time, I'll bring on some guests who I'm working with who will be more than happy to kind of talk about how they're actually changing it from a, like a fintech company or a hearing aid company, of like different people who are willing to at least share kind of like how they're thinking about sales differently or sales leaders who are thinking about sales differently. And these are seasoned people who've been at about four, five, six companies, and now they're the head of it and going like, I knew all these things. I had no language to talk about it. And now we have the ability to kind of experiment, innovate, prototype, to try different things. But the reality is like, I kept thinking somebody else had the answer and I realized nobody has the answer and we have to go figure it out. I'm like, that's right. That's yeah. what I'm willing to work with somebody is, is that, that the answers are very specific to context. 
and that people are looking for a generalized answer because of the way we teach sales. It's just a process. It's just a generalized process that everybody follows and it's more about product than it is about customers. Well, That's why we're in the, the, the state we're in, which is where we started the conversation. You've touched on so many crucial issues and I'm delighted and I definitely would love to take you up on that. I'm collaborating with an old friend of mine, Anthony Willoughby, and he's spent the last 45 years working with indigenous people in Papua New Guinea, the Mongols and the Maasai. And his premise is that if you don't understand the territory in which you occupy, uh, that you occupy, and you don't understand the map, and you don't understand the predators, competing tribes, the landscape, then you find it almost impossible to see all of this together. And I think part of the challenge here is that people come at a problem from where they are used to seeing it and from uh, where they've uh, grown up. You know, you've mentioned the church of finance, and a lot of metrics are driven by quarterly reporting, ROI, and in sales, it's activity-based behavior. But again, none of that serves the customer. That's, in, uh, that's yeah, but, an audit function in terms yeah, but you, yeah, but you need some, you need some way in which to kind of, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to go overboard on it. I just think the fact is we need to be able to understand the limitations of how we do it. Like when we set quarterly quotas, so in my office here, I have, uh, uh, hold on a second. Oh, in, in my office, I have these, for mentors, let me just switch screens for one second so you can at least see it. All right, so this is this is my office and where I'm at. But my four mentors, one the one the one on the on the on the right there is Dr. Deming, and he always say like, you need to get rid of quotas because it just causes really really bad behavior, and people actually once they reach the quota they stop and they don't actually focus on helping people make progress. And so to me, it's that notion of being able to say like, there are certain kind of concepts to to your point where. We compensate people on a yearly basis, right? And if they reach that quota, they actually get a bonus. And so the bonus structure is set up in a certain way. And so all of a sudden you start to realize like, but it's all arbitrary. And what we can say is, well, it's worked. Well, it has worked, but but now it's getting to the point where it's 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 caught like you see the the how it's changed people's behavior and and we need a different way to think about this. At some point, what, what I'm actually trying to do is rally the people, rally the right set of people to sit around the table and talk about how sales theory has to evolve because it's literally been reduced to, a, a, to almost like a mindless process of an order taker as opposed to the sophisticated profession that it really is because at some point in time, it's not as easy as everybody, anybody who doesn't sell. So in the book, I have this... Uh, this uh, uh, thing from Teddy Roosevelt about the, the man in the ring. And the reality is, is this whole aspect of like, most people look in at it and go like, well, that seems pretty easy. Like, it's just, they do this and this and this. They don't understand that the salesperson has to know costs. They have to know actually uh, price. They have to know timing. They have to know the customer. They have to know psychology. They have, they're like the hub of the company as it relates to helping the customer. At the end of the day, most really good salespeople are the smartest people in the in the organization. That's why usually founders start out as the salespeople because they know everything. Salespeople are conductors of an orchestra. Exactly. If you have the violins playing out of sync with the bassoon and with the harp and the uh, the timpani, you're going to end up with a cacophony if they're not working in concert. And the way I like to look at it is as either an orchestra or captain of a ship. Only one person is captain. Everyone else is crew. And the salesperson should be coordinating to make sure that the right conversations are happening at the right time, in the right way, with the right people. And there is a natural sequence, which is driven not by the seller, but by the buyer. Because yep. as you go through your process of those six different stages, Unless we meet the buyer where they are, we will create unnecessary friction and resistance. And the orchestra will play out of tune and it will just make a terrible noise. And we'll end up in free consulting. We'll end up wasting a lot of energy on pursuits we cannot or should not win. We will be pushing them to try and make a decision prematurely. I have one client that I've been working with this past year. And at 220% of quota, his boss was giving him grief uh, yep. because he wasn't getting enough quotes out. 
Now, everyone else in his team is struggling <laughs> between 40 and 60 percent of quota, and he has about one eighth of their quota ratio. So he's sending out far fewer quotes, but 90 percent of them convert because he's doing a proper job. He's working. Yeah, but that, but that, that's, yeah, that's my exact point of I don't need more leads. I need better leads. And the fact is, like, I only write a quote. Like, so in my business, I actually don't write a quote until it's like we've already agreed. The quote is the final thing that, that you literally helps people get everybody else on board. So I don't actually write a contract, but I'll actually do presentations. I'll sit down and give them a draft of things. But the notion of actually before I put in the pipeline, because I don't know at some point in time in passive looking, I really don't know when they're going to close and they want me to put a number on it. This is exactly the point. So now the one who's closing 90% of his quotes is like, well, he's cheating because he's not doing as many. And so his close rate is way better than everybody else's. His numbers are 200% above quota. His close ratio is through the roof. His number of quotes is down. It's like, and they're measuring all the wrong things. They should be measuring the pounds of cash that he brings in. Yeah. Right. Not these intermediate metrics that were set up because I can measure them. And it's like, Ooh, you know, he's, he's really not that good. And it's, it's, it's this cut your nose off to spite your face kind of thing that you just realize. And it's like, we have a policy. It's like, what policy is that? <laughs> Just because you have a policy. One of my favorite posters comes from a company called despair.com, my third favorite website yeah. on the planet. Yeah. And it's a picture of the Pamplona bull run. And the headline is tradition. And the caption underneath says, just because you've always done it that way doesn't mean it's not incredibly stupid. <laughs> right. The problem is that so often people are trapped by their tradition, by their policy, by their bad habits, and they don't spend enough time in reflection. I've been so blessed that I've been able to interview some of the world's best young salespeople, you know, five to seven years experience. And these are people who are hyper self-reflective and yeah. they spend time asking themselves the question, personally taking responsibility and asking, what did I do or fail to do? What did I say or fail to say that caused that outcome? They're not afraid to ask for help. They're not afraid to challenge the status quo. And they go through quite a lot of grief uh, because yep. the management uh, pushes them and says, well, that's not the way we do things around here. Well, why the hell not? That's the first question that should, people should be asking. They should also be asking, well, what is it that actually works? Let's look at the best in the world. Who can we go to to find out what they do that works consistently? I have another client, eight months into his new job. He's not expected to generate a single cent for 14 months. And at eight months in, he's 200% a quota. Why? Yeah. Because he's doing everything against the book. He's aligning himself. And these are enterprise sales, so they're not small. They're yeah. six, seven figures. And he's knocking the ball out of the park. Why? Because he's aligning with the customer. He's paying attention. He's listening. He's understanding their motivation. He understands their why. He understands how they've got there because he's taken the time to have them tell their story and making sure that he's coordinating all those resources to arrive at that point where they can make the decision today. So one of the ways I think about it is sales is like the from a human body perspective, it's like the digestive system and muscles. Like it's the things you have to go do is basically sales. Blood is the cash flow. If I don't have blood, I I, I don't I can't live. And and the management systems like the 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 brain. It's the neurological systems that that basically tell us when to do things and basically uh, takes the data in and decides what to do and what not to do. Right. But the thing is, is that that what we 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 keep thinking the blood and the and the brain are the most important organs. But the reality is like, if I don't eat, I will die. <laughs> if I don't move, I will die. And so part of this is to realize like, this is a give and take across these things. And no one of them is, is, is more important than the other because they don't, you don't survive without having all three of these. And so part of this is to realize like, what's the give and take. And so most people say, well, you know, there's a financially run organization and there's a, a sales driven organization, or there's a kind of a, a operational driven organization. My thing is, is the best companies are balanced between these and that the executives can have the open discussions, not from a political perspective, but can have these discussions to know as the environment changes, what do we need to do to compensate or to cope or to adjust to get there? 
But if we listen to, for example, the financial side of it, we literally, in the time of a pandemic, you basically lean back. You literally cut everything back and you basically say, we're just going to wait until things come back. But the salespeople are like, look, there's no food. We got to pivot the business. What else can we do? How are we actually going to do it? And so you, you start to realize like the muscles in the digestive system, they lean in because they're hungrier. <laughs> and so part of this is to realize they actually need some blood to actually go figure out how to pivot the business, but yet there is none. And so it's this whole aspect of realizing it's a system and it has to work together and there's trade-offs. And that we, if we don't think about things this way, we end up trying to isolate or say like, we've got to do this or we got to do that. It's like, sometimes we have to do both or sometimes we have to do neither. Sadly, we're coming to the top of the hour. We've still got quite a few things I want to talk about. One of the things in the book that you talk about, which I think is really interesting, is uh, def clearly defining the differences and necessary interdependencies between sales and marketing, sales and customer service. You might spend a couple of minutes on that. I think that the aspect here is that the metrics by which we run marketing in this, and quote, the funnel, the lead funnel, right? In most cases, they're correlative and they're uh, triangulating, meaning anybody who raises their hand, we know who they are, we know kind of the company they work for, the size of it, but we actually don't understand why. And so what you end up having is people and the goal of, of the funnel is to generate more leads. And if you start to rethink this, you start to realize that leads, leads become a point in time, not just a, a person or an organization. And so part of this is that, that this is the part that then causes the friction with uh, the, the sales, right? And so part of this is actually spending the time. So what's interesting is the, one of the companies I'm working with, the marketing people go on sales calls. They literally share different perspectives on it. And, and you start to realize like at some point the marketers understand, they, can, they almost can see it from the outside, but they don't feel the pressure to, to one to close, but they, don't, oh, they also don't understand like how the customer is going to make the decision. They, they almost feel like as soon as I know what the features are, I'm done. I just got to communicate that. And the, the reality is, is how do we actually move it through? So to me, there's a very large interdependence between the three or parts of the organization. And yet we don't allow market, we don't give the space, we don't give the time, we don't enable people because we're trying to be so efficient to understand how the three should interact together. My belief is that by loosening up and enabling people to interact more, you'll actually build a way better system because at some point there is this interdependence and we're trying to design it to be very modular where it has a very standard interface of I just give you leads, but the lead quality and the conversion rates, like I'm working with one company where the conversion rate is like two and a half or 3%. I'm like, how is that acceptable on any front? Absolutely. <laughs> All that does is breed like, well, I don't want to give anybody my email because in some way they're going to call me forever and I'm going to get harassed the entire time. And it's like, how do I get off? The, like, and you start to realize, like, how do we actually rethink like this whole notion of the lead funnel? When are people ready? How are people ready? And you start to, when you reflect these kinds of questions through the timeline, you start to realize like, oh, that's what I should be doing. Here's how I should do it. So it gives you a frame to start to think about marketing, sales, and and customer success, but it also starts to identify kind of the interdependence between them and the, the things you have to, we still have to create in order to actually make the, the, the system as a whole better to enable people to make progress as opposed to how do we make marketing better? How do we make sales better? How do we make customer success better? Well, the sacrifice I'm seeing is people are sacrificing effectiveness for efficiency. Yep. And this is where the massive growth in some fabulously well thought through tools in marketing automation, sales enablement, all of that kind of stuff. A good tool used badly is probably worse than doing nothing. Oh, and for sure. There are a couple of examples of this. Came across uh, one client of mine. They were doing 600 free downloads a month and they converted one every two months from those downloads. So their system actually wasn't serving them because they were doing demos to people who could not buy. And they were tying up salespeople to have 1,200 conversations with people who were not in a position, not willing or not able to buy. Came across another company and they had 125 million pounds worth of marketing qualified opportunities, of which they converted 7 million. Now, how on earth can you possibly believe that that is a good way to run a business? That strikes me as complete idiocy. 
Yeah, so that's one of the things where I feel like as as a little bit of an outsider to the sales, I've run sales organizations. I, I would consider myself more uh, an innovator and an engineer than a salesperson. But at the same time, the fact is, is like somebody from the outside has to start calling people out on this stuff, right? And so it's people, it's very hard to call people out from the inside. And so what I want to be able to do is, is start to have these conversations from the outside and people go like, you know, we have that problem or we, that's exactly where we're at. We need to think about it that way because because nobody's actually having these kinds of conversations. And, and at the same time, it's like, well, it's always been that way. It's like, yeah, but maybe we need to change the way we generate leads. Maybe maybe we actually have to think about things in a different way. Like it's, it's one of those things where they just accept it because it's there. But then here's the thing is when they start to change, they actually don't know what to change to and they don't know what better really means. And so the fact is, is that this is what holds them to say like, well, it's too much work because I, I have to run the process. They don't give people time to work on the business. They just work in the business. And so this is where I want to, I want to start to have people take, you know, where every company I've built, I've given people at least 20% of their time to work on the business as opposed to just work in the business. But in the book, I have this uh, technique we use all the time. It's called game on, game off. Game on is where we talk about the content. We're talking about working in the business. So we'll be in the middle of a meeting. We'll be talking about something specific. And I'll say game off. Game off means now let's talk about the process we're using to do this. Do we need to change it? Is this not working? Is there a better way to do this? Okay, game back on. Let's now, now talk about the content this way. Very so, and, and so it's this aspect of enabling people to talk about the process as opposed to just bitch about the outcomes. One of the most valuable lessons anyone can ever learn is that if you want better answers, you have to ask better questions. And I think part of the problem is that if you come from a particular perspective, it was Einstein's definition around this, which is you, you cannot solve a problem by tackling it from the position that created it. And you need to be able to step back and you have to ask yourself challenging, difficult, uncomfortable, often naive questions basic question is, well, why do we do it that way? When did yeah. we start? And was it ever relevant? And is it still relevant today? I have found this conversation incredibly enlightening. And I would love to have you back to go through 201 and 301 as they're evolving. So let's do this. Why don't we, why don't we uh, um, kind of end it here? But let's ask the listeners to prompt you questions. To say, like, based on, on our conversation today, what are the things that are, you are now questioning? What are the things that are making you think about kind of how you run your sales organization or your marketing organization differently? What problems did we actually kind of help highlight? And what new questions do you have because of our conversation? Fabulous. You took the words right out of my mouth. Um, Bob, uh, two, uh, three very quick questions, first of all. Um, and this isn't about regret, but if you had a golden ticket, yeah. and you could go back to your 23-year-old idiot self who yeah. probably would have ignored this advice. What choice bit of advice would you give him? Yeah, I think the, the biggest thing is, is so I'm dyslexic. And one of the things that I did is I, I my mom basically uh, taught me a lot of ways to kind of hack it. But one of the things was never to let people know that I was dyslexic. And so I took a, an hour a day to learn how to spell. And I did it for almost 35 years where I finally realized like, okay, I'm not going to learn how to do this. So, so I got back almost eight hours a week and I realized like my whole life up to 35, people kept telling me like to work on my weaknesses. You're good at this, but boy, you really need to work on that. And my, my advice to myself would be is like, screw it. Don't worry about your weaknesses. Go find some other, other people who are good at your weaknesses and double down on your strengths. That's what I would tell myself. Fabulous advice. Again, work on your strengths. They are your best development. Oh. Putting me in a room to study Excel, you can put me in there for a month. I'll still be sure. <laughs> okay, next question. Books that have inspired you or podcast videos that you recommend other people would pay heed to? Yeah, so I think the biggest one for me is a book called The End of Average by Todd Rose, where he literally talks about how we end up creating the system around this notion of the average that actually doesn't exist. And so what it does is it forces us to think about statistics and, and metrics and numbers where a larger sample size of a bad question doesn't make the question better. <laughs> right? Yeah, absolutely. And so I think, I think that that's one of them. I think the other one is the notion of how to fly a horse. 
by Kevin Ashton, which is this notion of like that he he debunks a lot of the a lot of the notion of innovation to say like we all innovate, we all innovate every day in our lives. We need to be not afraid of it, but we need to actually embrace it. And and he talks through kind of like. Um, you know, most people think you have to be smart to be uh, 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 an innovator, or you have to be kind of gifted in some way. And what he's, he he basically comes back and says, to innovate, it takes hard work and lots of reps. And the fact is, is that like that is the number one reason why most of these people, when you look at it, even when people say they've had an aha moment, they did a thousand hours of work before that got to the the aha. There wasn't just a out of nowhere the aha came. And so excellent. It, it's hard work, and, and that, that's the other book I would recommend. Brilliant. Bob, thank you so much. How can people get hold of you? Through LinkedIn, Bob Mesta, M-O-E-S-T-A. You can, uh, on Twitter, I'm at B Mesta. And then um, yeah, I have uh, the Rewired Group uh, is, the, is the name of my firm. And then BobMesta.com. And my book, uh, I have a couple books, but the book that I'm talking about now is mostly uh, Demand Side Sales, and it's at Amazon. Excellent. Bob Mesta, thank you. Thank you. This has been a joy. This is Marcus Kauke signing off once again from the Inquisitor podcast. If you found this conversation insightful, then please get in touch with your questions. And Bob and I will have several other conversations, I hope, (laughs) where we will address those questions directly. And if you feel that you'd be a good guest or you think you know someone who would be, then email me at marcus at laughs-last.com or get in touch with me uh, via LinkedIn. In the meantime, stay safe and happy selling, and get hold of Bob's book, Demand Side Selling. Bye-bye.